Okay, we'll just start up here in prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for your grace, for your forgiveness. God, how you've been patient with each one of them, uh, each one of us. Lord, how you've blessed each one of us. Lord, we just want to come again, sit at your feet. We want to hear from you. Lord, I pray, God, I would be invisible. I pray that you would just shine ever so bright, Lord. In spite of me, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would teach us. Lord, I just know, God, that um, your people long to hear from you. Your people long to have a touch from you. Lord, and so I just pray you minister to your people, minister to the body. Lord, we love you. Our ears are open. Our hearts are open. We're ready to receive, Lord. Speak to us. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. So, Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and your household, because I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. So last week we looked at verse 1 in depth. We talked about uh, hearing God's voice. We talked about Noah's faith, his obedience, his trust in the Lord, his commitment to the Lord. We also did a brief word study in regards to God's invitation to come into the ark, the ark of salvation. And, and we were encouraged by the understanding that when you're Facing storms of life, God is in the boat with you. You're not alone. And we also talked about God's heart for the family, how it's God's intention that when we get saved, our faith would have an impact, would have an influence on our families. God's heart is for our families to come to a saving knowledge of His Son also. And so if you missed last week's study, I just want to encourage you, get a hold of it. You know, you can watch it on YouTube and just, uh, just yeah, if you miss it, just, just watch it. There's so much to glean from verse 1. It's, it's really incredible. Verse 2, it says, You shall take with you seven, each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Now, there are a lot of people that they want to just find fault with the Bible. They look for every excuse to just knock the Bible. And they point to this verse and they say, see, you can't trust the Bible. You know, it's just full of contradictions. Back in chapter 6, God said, take two of each of the animals. And, you know, here he says, bring seven. So which is it? Is it two pairs? Is it seven pairs? I mean, you just can't trust the Bible. It's full of contradictions. Well, is that true? Is the Bible full of contradictions? Is this a contradiction? No, it's not a contradiction. You have to look carefully at what it says. It says, you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, two each uh, of animals that are unclean. God is clarify, clarifying his instructions to Noah here, and he's making a distinction uh, between the clean and the unclean animals. Now, I actually find this very interesting, to tell you the truth. Why seven pairs of clean animals? Well, two reasons at least. One, Genesis 9, we're going to see when Noah gets off the ark, all the animals are going to become food for Noah. Um, prior to Genesis 9, Noah and his family, they're vegetarians. They just ate of the herbs of the, the field. But after the flood, things are going to change. After the flood, God's going to tell Noah that the animals are food for him and his family. So that's the first reason. Secondly, well, the seven pairs of clean animals are for sacrifices. All right? And as we learned previously, there's only one way to come to God. There's only one way to approach God, and that's through the shed blood of the innocent for the sake of the guilty, in place of the guilty. And the reason that I find this so interesting is actually God is instructing Noah, right, to prepare for a need that Noah doesn't actually know that he's going to have. Noah doesn't know uh, that the animals are going to be food for him. I mean, you know, he doesn't understand right now at this moment in chapter 7 that when he gets off the ark, you know, what's he going to eat? He's probably not thinking about that. He may not be thinking that far ahead of the game. Um, 
You know, how often does God do things like this in our life where he provides for a need before we actually know that there's a need? He does it a lot. I mean, I can't tell you how many times God has blessed Tina and I with a little extra money. And we're just like, praise the Lord. You know, we got some extra money and we're going to be able to get that thing, you know, that we got our eyes on only to find out that God gave us extra money for a need. It was there to meet a need that we hadn't yet had, that we haven't yet realized, right? And I think it's exactly what we see in the birth of Jesus's life. You'll remember that at Jesus's birth, the wise men, they show up and they present the child Jesus with these gifts. They present the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And it was God's provision to finance the trip to Egypt, right? Before uh, Mary and Joseph knew that they were headed to Egypt, and God brought provision because Herod was gonna seek to kill the child Jesus, and God told him to leave. And so before he tells them, he provides for them. I just find that just so wonderful. You know, and as far as the sacrifices go, right? Noah may not be thinking about sacrifices. He may not be thinking right now about worshiping the Lord uh, when he gets off the ark. How many times have you packed for a trip only to find out that you forgot something important? I mean, I know, I know we have. I mean, one time I called Tina up from work and I said, hey, sweetie, you know what? Get ready. Let's go to Monterey for the weekend. And so she packed, you know, she got ready. And, uh, you know, we forgot to bring clothes. <laughs> I mean, it happens, right? Yeah, I can't tell you. I've been on so many mission trips. I mean, I'm a seasoned veteran missionary. And I can't think of one trip where I didn't get someplace and think, dang, how did I forget that? You know, a converter or whatever it is. I mean, you get so caught up in the preparation of the trip, you know, that uh, you just forget. You just forget stuff, you know? And what I love is how patient God is with us. What I love is how gracious God is with us, how he provides for us. Like I say, oftentimes before we even know that there's going to be a need. And of course, the greatest example of this is what? Well, it's the cross, right? I mean, the Bible talks about how we're dead in our sins and trespasses, how we've gone astray, and none of us, no, not one is righteous, and none are seeking after God. And the Bible speaks that actually we're children of wrath by nature. And the Bible goes so far as to say that we're actually even enemies of God. And before I was even aware of my need for a Savior, before any of us were aware of our need for a Savior, you know, Christ came to seek and save that which was lost. He came to lay down his life, to give his life a ransom for many, that we might be saved. God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Long before the need was ever known, God made a provision for us. And it's been said that that man's greatest need was God's greatest deed. And you know what? It's true. And it all occurred before we ever had any understanding of our need. Verse 3. Also, seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days... I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days, 40 nights, 40 being the number of judgment. And I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all the Lord commanded him. Here again, we read of Noah just as this tremendous, this wonderful example of faith and obedience. Obedience is always the evidence of true faith. And it's worth taking a minute here just to pause and just to step back and just to ask, is the Lord instructing you to do something? Is he prompting you to do something that you've just been putting off? You know, if you'll follow through with what the Lord is instructing you to do, if you'll 
If you'll be willing to be led by the Spirit and just do those things that He's prompting you to do, the result is going to be unbelievable blessing, right? I think of a, <clears throat> a time when we lived in Germany. Um, there, the man that lived across the street from us, uh, Dieter, he was the burgermeister of our village. Um, burgermeister is, is like the mayor. It literally means in German like prominent citizen. Um, but he was a mayor of, of Leutershausen for probably 30 years or more. And everybody loved Dieter. And Tina saw it one day Dieter was outside. And uh, she noticed that, you know, it looked like he lost a lot of weight. And uh, over a short period of time, Tina also noticed that people were coming and going. They were visiting uh, Dieter and Frau Grundel's house. And, well, that's how we know them. We know them as Dieter and Frau Grundel. Frau Grundel is Dieter's wife. And anyway, you know, she just noticed people coming and going. And then one day she noticed a band was at uh, Dieter's door. And, you know, if you're a prominent citizen, if you're a well-known, a, a beloved citizen in a village, you know, a band will come and play at your door when it's your birthday. It's really a nice tradition. But also they'll come when you're really, really sick. And so Tina, remember that she saw a lot of people visiting uh, Frau Grundel and Dieter. And she started to wonder if, if Dieter was sick. So one day she was outside and, you know, we just live right across the street there. And Tina felt the Lord speaking to her heart to go to Dieter's house and to talk to him. And, you know, uh, she hears God's voice and she just begins to wrestle. As, as I know, you, you understand what's going on, right? I mean, you just begin to wrestle like, God, is that really you? I mean, what am I supposed to do? What, what would I say? You know, how, how would I be able to, you know, go there? And what, what am I going to do? And there's just all these questions. And Tina sensed that the Lord just spoke to her and she said, just go. And so Tina knew that it was the Lord wanted her to go to talk to Dieter. And so she, she started to pray, Lord, how am I going to be able to talk to him? I don't even know what's the matter with him. Um, Lord, if you want me to talk to him, you're going to have to open doors. You're going to have to make it happen, work it out. And so Tina walked up to the house and she knocks on the door and Frau Grundel uh, opens the door and Tina says, is, is Dieter uh, doing okay, you know? And Frau Grindel, she just said, no, Dieter's dying of cancer. He's dying and she's broken. And uh, Frau Grindel asked Tina, she says, would you like to come in? And of course, Tina said, yeah, I'd like to come in. And then and as Tina walks in, she's just like, Lord, how am I going to get alone with Dieter to be able to talk to him? And so Frau Grundel, you know, she, she asked Tina if she would uh, like to talk to, to Dieter. And she says, yeah. And so she comes in. Uh, Frau Grundel takes Dieter upstairs to his bedroom. And she's just thinking, Lord, how am I going to get alone with him? And Frau Grundel says, hey, would you mind sitting with Dieter while I go downstairs and get something to eat? She hadn't eaten yet and she was a little bit hungry. And so, of course, Tina said, yes, she would sit there and, and be with him. And and Tina was able to talk to Dieter. She was able to talk to him about the Lord. And she was able to pray with him. And you don't understand, I mean, this is so far out of Tina's wheelhouse. And it would be just, you know, ridiculously uncomfortable for all of us, too. But because she was obedient, she got to see God move. She got to see God open doors as she was actually praying, just amazing answers to her prayer. And she also had the privilege to pray with a dying man. And I think it was just, I mean, it was just a matter of days and Dieter was gone. Tina's concern for Dieter, I think, is what has cemented a friendship and has given a, a Tina an open door with Frau Grundel. I mean, when we left Frau Grundel, she cried when we left Germany. And uh, she gives, gives, sends us a Christmas card every year. And I just tell you, following through on what God is prompting you to do, following through on those things that God is instructing you to do, the result is blessing. It's a result is always blessing when we just follow through. And now Tina, after following through what God has asked her to do, you know, she has this wonderful testimony 
of how God moved on her behalf and used her to pray with this dying man and to open doors before her that seemed impossible. And they opened again as she was praying. So again, I want to ask you, is there something that God has, has put on your heart to do? Is he instructing you or prompting you to do something? My encouragement to you would be do it. Don't delay. Be obedient and see what God would do through your obedience. I think you'll find if you're willing to be led by the Spirit, if you're obedient to those prompting of God, those promptings of God, you're going to see God do amazing things. And you're going to see tremendous fruitfulness be birthed because of your obedience. If God is speaking to your heart, maybe it's more important than you actually realize. Maybe you need to share with that friend or that neighbor today. Maybe you need to write that letter today. Maybe you need to reconcile with that person today. Maybe tomorrow will be too late. Maybe you'll miss out on what God has for you. Noah is such a beautiful example of faith here. Like I said last week, obedience is the pathway to blessing. Verse 6, Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So Noah, with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean animals of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. You know, again, I think a lot of people read this story and they, they just want to make fun of it. You know, like, how did Noah get all those animals in the ark? I mean, that's impossible. They're just, they're just naysayers. I mean, Genesis 6.20 tells us that God brought the animals to Noah. He said that they'll come to you. And here in verse 9, it says that the animals went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God commanded Noah. And when God says something's going to happen, you know what? You can trust it's going to happen. You can just rest assured if God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Whether you can figure it out whether you can figure out how God is going to do it or not, it's still going to happen. You know, I don't even try to figure out anymore how God is going to work something out because I just, I just got to a place where I'm tired of being wrong. <laughs> you know, God does it. I, I've stopped trying to figure it out because, yeah, it's just too much. Noah didn't have to go out and round up all the animals. We're told again that the animals come to Noah. And it's something that God had done in the past. Remember back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. God brought the animals to Adam so he could name them. Genesis 2, 19, it says, Out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whenever, whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. Noah didn't have to worry about it. He didn't have to think like, oh no, you know, how's God going to do that? No, God has a way to accomplish whatever it is God wants to do. Whether we can figure it out or not, God is able. One suggestion is how the animals got to God, or sorry, got to Noah. As you know, animals have this migratory instinct, and God just put this migratory instinct in them to go uh, to Noah. It's not out of the realm of possibility. I mean, we see it in nature uh, today. I was looking up some of the migratory uh, instincts of birds. I mean, it's pretty, pretty amazing, you know? I mean, you know, everybody knows the migra uh, migratory um, instincts of the monarch butterfly. That's an amazing story. I chose to pass over that. But I did choose these two to relate to you. There's these birds called the bar-tailed godwits. <laughs> yeah, these guys are amazing because their migratory trip is more than 7,200 miles. I mean, they start off in Alaska and they fly nonstop to New Zealand. I mean, just figure it out, a nonstop flight, Alaska to New Zealand. Uh, yeah, I could make a, a coach joke here versus a business class, but... I don't know what business class is like. I've never flown it. One day, God willing, I get bumped. But anyway, 
They, they're down in New Zealand, and when they migrate back to Alaska, they actually have a stop off in China. They stop off in China for a little bit, get a little Chinese food, store up, and then they head over to Alaska. And they do this every single year. There are these birds called terns. They, they start off in Alaska, and they winter in Hawaii. I mean, like, how smart are these birds? I mean, we got like, what do we get? 10 feet of snow here or more? I mean, you know, oh, Rhea says way more. Uh, guess what? Winter, <laughs> wintering in Hawaii doesn't sound so bad, you know? Anyway, the crazy thing is that these birds, they lay their eggs, you know? And those eggs hatch, and they take off to Hawaii, mom and dad. They want to get away for the weekend without the kids. And then when the kids are strong enough, they fly to Hawaii themselves. How do they know where Hawaii is? They've never been there. I mean, they're just a few months old. How do they know how to get to Hawaii with never being there before? Well, it's this God-given uh, instinct to migrate there. You know, Tina and I, our family, we're from Southern California. And every year it's a big deal when the swallows return. They fly from Alaska. They come to the mission, San Juan Capistrano and other places in Southern California. They do it every single year. None of them gets lost and ends up in Albuquerque. You know, I mean, it's crazy. God just puts this in them. You know, um, to me, if you can embrace Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you can embrace the fact that God spoke the heavens and the earth into existence out of nothing, you know what? Then you can understand how God's able to put it into animals, this migratory instinct to go and, and get on the ark to be saved. It's not hard for God at all to miraculously cause animals to migrate to the ark in pairs of two or pairs of seven so that they can be preserved in the ark. God is able. Man, I love this verse. You know it, Ephesians 3.20. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above of all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Well, what does that mean? Well, it could mean to according to the power that we allow to work in us. Maybe if I wouldn't limit the Holy Spirit, God would do so much more in my life. But it could also just mean, you know, it's according to the power of the Holy Spirit that works in us. God, there's nothing that limits God other than, you know, me. You know, God forbid that we limit the Lord. Verse 10 says, And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. So God gives us final seven-day period before the flood comes. Seven last days before judgment. Why do you think God did that? Why do you think that God provides this seven final day period before He sends judgment onto the world? A final seven before He pours out um, yeah, judgment. Why do you think He did, does that? It's because God is long-suffering. That's why. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God tells Ezekiel to speak to the nation of Israel. And, you know, He tells Ezekiel, and Ezekiel just, on behalf of God, begins to plead with the nation of Israel. I mean, it's almost begging. Ezekiel 33, 11. God says to Ezekiel, Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die? And you know, we see God's heart here in this this final seven-day period as he gives one more opportunity to a sinful, wicked world to repent and just come to the Ark of Salvation. But not only is that what we see literally here in the story, and that's what I believe is going on, 
But not only that, I think God is painting a picture for us too about a final period of seven ahead of us. And it's not going to be a seven day period, but it's going to be a seven year period. It's another demonstration of God's long suffering towards mankind. And this seven year period, it's called the Great Tribulation. And it's a demonstration of his long suffering towards a Christ rejecting world, giving them just another final opportunity to repent and come to Christ. I mean, our God is so gracious. The world that's rejected him time and time again, denying his free gift of salvation, refusing to come to him, refusing to receive forgiveness for their sins, just refusing him, rejecting him, turning away from him, wanting nothing to do with him. And yet, he still reaches out to mankind and gives, gives them another chance to repent. I mean, it's overwhelming to me. That's true love. Like we sing the song, that is truly amazing grace. Verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, you know, I'm a little bit of a Star Trek fan, and I just can hear Captain Picard say, Captain's Log. I mean, maybe that's what Noah's doing here. He's keeping a captain's log. It's like he's journaling. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, to me, this is also a reminder that, you know what? There's no retirement for a follower of Jesus. I mean, uh, there's no retirement from being a Christian. There may be a retirement, hopefully, for me sometime in the future for Social Security. You know, hopefully I'll get a little bit when I get to be a certain age. But there's no retirement from my witness as a believer. You know, I used to tell my patients when they found out I was a, a Christian or they found out I was a pastor or a missionary or whatever the case, they would always ask me about it. And I would just say, hey, caring for patients as a doctor, that's what I do. But Christian, that's what I am. There's no retirement from who I am. And I think I told you once before, you know, I applied for a job when I was in Germany. And I applied to supplement our income. And uh, during the interview, they asked me, you know, what are your professional goals? <laughs> you know, I just laugh. <laughs> My professional goals are to die in the mission field telling somebody about Jesus Christ who's never heard before. That's my professional goal. Didn't get the job. <laughs> anyway, it says in this, it just cracks me up. What are your professional goals? Oh, let me tell you. Oh yeah, we don't like that professional goal. Anyway, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the foundations of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. And you might underline, you might circle, at least in your mind, that those words, on that day. God said it was going to happen, and it happened. God said he was going to cause a flood to come on the earth, and on that day, man, it started to flood. The flood came, it happened. And we see this over and over in Scripture. God said something's going to, going to happen, and it happens. God says he's going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah for their wickedness, and it happened. God said he's going to send a Messiah into the world, and it happened. God said that there's a day coming that he's going to rapture the church. No man knows the hour. No man knows the day, the hour of his coming. But it's going to happen just the way God says it's going to happen. If God says it's going to happen, you can count on it. Hebrews 9.27, I'm also reminded of the verse that says, And it is appointed to a man, it is appointed for man to die once, but after this, the judgment. There is a day on God's calendar where everyone will die and stand before him and give an account for their life. 
He says that's going to happen. It's going to happen. No one is promised a tomorrow. You know, I think about, remember Kobe Bryant. Man, you know what? I mean, the guy's on top of the world, and the next thing you know, hey, he's dead. Nobody is promised a tomorrow. The shocking statistics are these. 10 out of 10 people die. It's a 100% mortality rate. Acts 4.12, Peter, speaking of Jesus, said, For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you don't know Jesus today, boy, won't you come to him and just receive forgiveness? Don't wait till it's too late. The Bible says that every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. We can confess him as Lord in this life unto salvation. Or we can waste this life living for ourselves, for selfish pleasures and die. And we'll stand before the Lord then and we'll bow the knee and we'll confess that he's Lord. But then it will be unto damnation, unto condemnation. Verse 11, again, it says, On that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. So it wasn't just rain. God opened up the fountains of the great deep and allowed these subterranean reservoirs of water to just gush up, to geyser up, I guess. And then the water canopy, that vapor uh, canopy that we've talked about in weeks past that is in the atmosphere that's surrounding the earth. You know that water you know, probably condenses? And then all of a sudden there's this, this tremendous torrential downpour on the earth. You know, I don't know if you knew this or not. Maybe it's news. But it's kind of interesting to me. If you took the earth and leveled all the landmass right now, you know, you brought all the high Mount Everest down, and you brought all the Dead Seas up and leveled things out, which, by the way, is the way many scientists think that the earth was before the flood. Many scientists believe that when the fountains of the great deep were broken up, it was during that action that these mountain ranges were pushed up. It was during that action that, you know, ground began to sink down. But if you were to take all the landmass today and level it out, there's enough water on the face of the earth right now to, again, if all the land was leveled out, there's enough water on the face of the earth to cover the earth 8,810 feet deep in water. That's 1.67 miles deep. I mean, to me, that's amazing. Because people say, oh, there's not enough water to flood the earth. Oh, yeah, there's plenty of water to flood the earth. It says, verse 12, And the rain was on the earth 40 days, 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons, with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. So here's a question for you. Were there dinosaurs on the ark? What day, what day did God create the dinosaurs? Well, it was the sixth day, right? It says in regards to the sixth day, Genesis 125, and God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, that means dinosaurs, and God saw that it was good. So were there dinosaurs on the ark? Well, yes, of course there were dinosaurs on the ark. I mean, we see it right here in verse 14, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind. Now, Noah probably didn't, you know, have a full full grown T-Rex running around on the decks of the ark. You know, he probably had a dinosaur egg. You know, we're yet to find a dinosaur egg greater than one foot in diameter. I mean, they're not that big. Maybe he just, you know, took a baby dinosaur. I don't know. 
But it is probably after the flood when atmospheric conditions began to change. You know, that vapor can canopy is now gone. You know, it's allowing the, uh, the UV and infrared, those harmful rays to penetrate the atmosphere. And we know that those UV infrared rays, rays they actually accelerate the uh, aging process. And we see the lifespan of man beginning to decrease. And maybe the lifespan of the animals also begin to decrease here. And reptiles, dinosaurs are reptiles, and maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but as long as reptiles are alive, they continue to grow. So with the decreasing lifespan of animals, the harmful UV ultraviolet rays uh, penetrating into the atmosphere, and then the change in climate, we're gonna see that in chapter eight, we're gonna see the, the beginning of changing of the climate. You know, maybe that's the reason that the dinosaurs died out. Verse 15, and they went into the ark to Noah two by two of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as, as God had commanded him and the Lord shut him in. Now, the Lord shuts the door of the ark. He shuts Noah and his family in the ark. And two things I think here it's worth noting. First off, you know, it's God who closes the door of the ark. And, and I just think that that's so very gracious of our Heavenly Father because He's sparing Noah, having this on his conscience as, you know, he knows that, boy, there's no hope for these people. There's no hope of salvation for those people that are outside of the ark. But secondly, Noah and his family, when God closes the door in the ark, you know what it tells us is that Noah and his family are now secure, right? They're securely shut in by the Lord. And the Bible teaches very clearly that our salvation is secure in Jesus. Now, I want you to just, if you've tuned out, just tune in here real quick, okay? I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. I want you to hear what I'm saying. Okay, this is a hard subject for, for some people. People will ask me all the time if I believe in eternal security. And my answer is always, yes, I do. For me. I'm not so sure about you. And what I mean by that is I've made a decision in my life that I'm going to run after Jesus. I'm going to run as hard and as fast uh, for Jesus as I can and just run away from the world. I'm not ever going to look back. I'm living my life for Christ. I'm all in. I'm sold out. I want every beat of my heart, every breath that I breathe to be for Jesus and for Him alone and to be for His glory. But you know what? I, I don't know about you. Our salvation is secure in Jesus. But outside of Jesus, you know what? I'm just, I'm just not sure. You know, what if Noah here... Think about this for me. Just think, think through it with me. What if Noah decides, you know, I don't want to be in the ark anymore. What if, you know, he looks around and he says, you know, I'm kind of tired of the people in the ark here. You know, I know each one of these guys and these girls pretty well. And you know what? They're not all that perfect by any means. Maybe Noah, you know, what if he, he looked around and he said, you know, all these people, they're really just a bunch of hypocrites. And so what does Noah do? He decides he's going to jump out of the ark. He's going to jump ship. Would he be saved then? Would he be safe and secure then? No, I don't think he would be. I think he would quickly drown in that same flood that judged the rest of the world. Turn in your Bibles real quick, okay? Turn to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27 it's a story of another group of people on a boat in a stormy situation. It, the, you may know it's Paul and 276 other people. They're on this boat and they're headed to, towards Rome. And they've been in this storm, it says, for many days. And it says that the sailors, I mean, they were losing hope and they're trying everything that they could think of 
just not to be lost at sea. And then Paul stands up in their midst in verses 22 and 20 through 25. Let's read it together. Acts chapter 27, 22 through 25. Paul says, he says, And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. I love it when in the New Testament we read, Do not be afraid. Why would the angel tell Paul, Do not be afraid? It's because he's afraid. <laughs> you know what? So he encourages him. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all that all those who sell with you. Therefore, Paul says, take heart, men, for I believe God that he will uh, be just. Uh, I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. Right? And the angel tells Paul, hey, Paul, don't worry. No one's going to die. You know what? Everyone's going to be saved. Everyone is secure. Don't worry at all, Paul. But then after some time passes, the storm's still raging. Some of the soldiers there in the boat, you know, they decided they want to get out of the boat. Look at verse 30 and 31. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they let down the skiff into the sea under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. You know what? I believe in eternal security for me because there's no way I'm going to get out of that boat. There's no way I'm getting out of the boat. Salvation and security is in that boat. And I think that there are others in the boat that are hard to get along with. It's true. I think that, you know, there are things, people in that boat, they hold opinions that maybe I don't agree with. But I'm not getting out of the boat. I'm staying in the boat. Uh, because the boat is where salvation is. I'm not getting out. God isn't going to make me go to heaven, though, if I don't want to go. If I want to get out of the boat, you know, I need to make a choice. Well, somebody, you know, when you start talking about choice, there are Christians, they, they say, listen, salvation is a sovereign work of God. It's election. It's predestination. You have no choice. It's just God. God chooses. And that's all there is to it. Okay. Really? Is that what the Bible has to say? Well, why did Joshua, speaking to the nation of Israel, those whom are elect by God, why does he say to them, uh, Joshua 24, 15, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorite in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, and Joshua here is revealing the choice that he's made. He's revealing it to the nation of Israel. And you know what he says. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If there's no choice, why does Elijah challenge the people when he goes to battle the prophets of Baal? And he says, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. 1 Kings 18, 21. Elijah's telling him, make a choice. Don't be on the fence between Elijah. Uh, uh, Jehovah or Baal. Make a choice, right? Elijah challenges them to make a choice. And please don't misunderstand me, okay? I'm not saying you can lose your salvation. That's not what I'm saying, right? It's not a set of keys. Hey, Tina, where's that salvation of mine? I can't remember where I put it. Where'd you have it last, Gary? No, it's not like that, right? Jesus said, John 10, 28 and 29, he says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. I mean, we're in the hand of Jesus. He goes on to say, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, 
and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I mean, here we are. It's this kind of a picture. Jesus' hand and, and the Father's hand, and we're in their hands, and we're secure. No one is going to snatch us out of the hands. But that's, that's where we want to remain. That's where we have to remain. If we choose to get out of the boat, you know what? I don't know if we can be saved. You may have a different opinion, and, and that's okay. You know, people come with different opinions, and they're still brothers and sisters. It's not something that I'm willing to break fellowship over if you hold a different opinion. But for me, this is the reason why I have this opinion. It's because as a pastor, as a missionary, as a Bible teacher, you know what? I never want to give somebody the impression that they can give their heart to Jesus and walk with Him for some time and then return to the world and just live for their own selfish pleasures. And, and I don't want them, if they chose to choose to do that, to feel secure in their salvation. You know, I open the Bible to Galatians 6, 7, and 8 and show them, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Don't be fooled. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Listen, here's the truth. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But in contrast, he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. I mean, you know what? <laughs> It's not how close we can get to the world and keep our salvation. It's how fast can we run to Jesus and leave the world behind. If you hold a different view, that's okay. You know what? I still love you. I'm still praying for you. We're still brothers. You know, that's not a reason to divide. But think it through. Think it through. Verse 17. Now the flood was on the earth 40 days. The water increased and lifted up the ark and it rose high above the earth. Now I just want you to Picture this in your mind, okay? Just try to imagine in your mind, right? As the ark lifts off the ground, can you imagine how the ark began to creak? How it kind of began to kind of make some noise? Have you ever in a boat that was kind of beached and then you push it out, you're in the boat, and you feel it's on the ground, but then all of a sudden you know it's afloat? Can you imagine that? Just imagine the ark no longer supporting its own weight on the ground. It's floating. And can you begin to hear people screaming as the water rises higher and higher and people began making their way to the ark? Can you imagine that? I mean, they come to the ark, they're carrying their valuables, those things that are just precious possessions, those things that they think they're going to need you know, later in life. Their kids are walking alongside of them. But then as the water rises to their knees and maybe to their waist, can you imagine how they're discarding those things that once were valuable? You know, they're coming, they discard those valuables, they pick up their kids, they're trying to keep their little ones above the water. Can you imagine hearing them screaming and crying out, banging on the ark, trying to get in? But you know what, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late to be saved as they try to keep their little ones above the water, trying to keep their little ones safe. It's too late. They've exhausted God's long suffering. That's exactly how Jesus said it would be in his second coming. Men are going to know the truth, but they won't turn to Jesus. They won't submit to his rule. And then that one day will come when it will be too late. Jesus said they'll be banging on the door saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then Jesus will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And again, you know this, I never knew you. It means I never had a relationship with you. You might know of Jesus, but that's not enough. But you know, the sad fact is this, there are people that they know the truth about Jesus, but they won't do anything about it. They've heard the truth about Jesus, but they won't act on it. They choose to do nothing about it. And then, you know what? 
one day it's going to be too late. Those who heard about Jesus and the salvation he offers, but they put it off so that they could just do their own thing and go their own ways, saying, you know what, I got plenty of time. You know, I'll just, I'll just come to Christ later on. You know what, it's going to be too late. One day it'll be too late. Nobody's guaranteed a tomorrow. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, today is the day you need to turn to him. You know, what a graphic warning this is for us as the waters lift the ark up above the earth. What a vivid warning this is to us. Now, as we go on, I just want to point this out. It's very clear in the language as we read uh, what the Bible teaches about the flood. It's very clear that the Bible teaches a global flood. It's not a local flood like some skeptics would um, say. And you can understand or underline these words and these phrases as we read it. Verse 18, the waters prevailed and greatly increased. Uh, there in the land of Israel? No, that's not what it says. The waters prevailed and greatly increased. There in the area of the Middle East? No. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth. And the ark moved about on the surface of the water. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth. And all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward. And the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And every man, all in whose nostril was the breath of life, uh, the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping things, a creeping thing, and birds of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the water prevailed on the earth 150 days. Now, the language is very clear. It's not a local flood. This is a global flood. And again, if this were a local flood, why didn't God have Noah build the ark? Why didn't God just tell Noah, hey, you know, up there on that mountaintop, just go up there, you're going to be safe. If it was a local flood, why did those that perish in the flood just not move to high ground, right? If it were a local flood, how are the high hills and all the mountains covered? If it were a local flood, how do you explain the geological record where you find marine life fossils in the Himalayas? And in fact, all the major mountain ranges of the world, you find marine fossils on those mountains. If it were a local flood, how do you explain every major culture of the world has a tradition of creation and a flood account? Cultures that have a tradition of flood, uh, there's lots of cultures that have this tradition of a flood account where it's one man and his family are uh, survive. And uh, this, this account is found all over the place. Hey, here's just a few. The Babylonian culture, the Syrian culture, the Egyptian culture, the Greek culture, the Hindu culture, the Chinese culture, the Fijian culture, the Brazilian culture, the Peruvian culture. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. If it were a local flood, where do these traditions uh, and where did this universal belief of this global flood, where did it come from? Now, it's true, if you look at these stories from these different cultures, hey, some of them are pretty bizarre. Uh, some of them are pretty strange when you look into them. But it would seem to me that the seed of truth that birthed these traditions you know, they came from what we're reading about right here. They came from uh, this account that the flood that, um, that God brought judgment onto the world through this flood. That's where the seed of truth, that kernel of truth came from. We also know it's not a local flood because Jesus relates his second coming 
to the flood where he says that he's going to um, judge the entire world. It, it's not just a local judgment. He's going to judge all mankind from all the nations of the world. And so, again, if you're not a believer in Jesus today, if you've never bowed your knees to Jesus and confessed him as Lord, if you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins and to take the, the throne of your life, you need to today. You know, this is, this is the day of salvation. There is another day that's coming when a holy God is going to judge all the nations and everyone is going to have to stand before him and give an account. There's going to be a judgment. God says there's a judgment coming. And just like every time he said it has come to pass, this will come to pass too. You can escape that, judge, that judgment and receive salvation. You can escape that judgment because Jesus, he bore the sin, uh, the penalty our sins uh, deserve. He bore them at the cross. And you can escape that, that judgment if you would just place your faith in him, receive his forgiveness, receive his righteousness, and be declared by God the Father justified, not guilty, because Jesus will take your sins and you won't have to answer for them. You know, don't be deceived into thinking, you know what, I have all kinds of time. You know, the day before Kobe Bryant got on that helicopter, eh, just that would be his last day, unthinkable. He didn't wake up thinking, you know what, I'm gonna die today. It catches everybody by surprise for the most part, right? Don't think that you have plenty of time. You know, I used to think before I was a believer in Jesus Christ, I used to think that, you know what, I know enough about the Bible. If I just start seeing certain things happen, that's when I'll get my uh, life right with the Lord. But you know what, that's a lie from Satan. You know what, you may not have another day to see those certain things happen, right? You may not have time to change your mind. By the time you see certain things happen, maybe your heart will be so hardened that you won't want to change your mind. I mean, if you hear the Lord knocking on your heart right now, this is the time to, to turn to the Lord because maybe then it'll be too late. And maybe then those doors will be closed. Now's the time. You know, if you like to receive Christ as your Savior, you know, all you have to do is just say a prayer and it just... There's no magic formula. There's no magic words. You just say it from the sincerity of your heart. And you just say, Father, forgive me. I'm a sinner. You can confess your sins. I've, I've done this and I've done that. And I know that it's not pleasing to you. And I know you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me. Lord, I want to just place my faith in his finished work of that cross. Lord, I want to turn from my sins. I ask you that you would forgive me and wash me in the blood of Jesus and give me the Holy Spirit so that I would have the power to live for you. I believe Christ died for me. I believe that he rose again. Father, would you just receive me, cleanse me. And you know what the beautiful truth is, the wonderful thing is, man, God will hear that prayer and he'll respond and he'll make you a new creation. He'll wipe that slate clean and he'll give you the power to, to live for him. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much again for your word. Your word is so wonderful. Lord, just the revelation of how gracious you are, how wonderful you are, how loving you are, how patient you are. And yet, Lord, there is a limit. We recognize there is a limit to your long suffering. Lord, for my brothers and sisters of the Calvary Chapel Church family, Lord, I want to pray for them, Lord. If, if there's something that you're speaking to their heart, Lord, pray you give them the strength. Pray you give them the courage to just take a step of faith and see if you won't show up and open doors for them, Lord. See if you won't um, bring that neighbor to Christ or reconcile that person again. Lord, whatever it may be, Lord, give my brothers and sisters strength to take a step of faith, Lord. And give them that testimony of obedience and blessing as a result. Lord, for those that maybe don't know you or those that, Lord, knew you and walked away from you and need to turn back to you, need to rededicate their life to you. 
or they know the way. For those that don't know you, that just pray to, pray to prayer of asking for forgiveness, God. I thank you that, that you hear their prayers, and I thank you that you answer those prayers. And Lord, I just pray that you would give them both, those that don't know you and those that have walked away from you. Give them the strength to now walk with you in communion and in fellowship and just run as hard and as fast as they can towards you and away from the world. Lord, we ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, if you ask Christ into your heart, if you ask him to forgive you for your sins, you know, get a hold of us at the church here, okay? Don't want anything from you. We want to walk with you through this journey. We want to answer questions that maybe you have. We want to get a Bible in your hand and just, you know, just let's encourage each other to run for Christ. Um, for everybody else, Calvary Chapel Church family, next Sunday, June 14th, Meadow, singular, don't make a mistake, don't look like a country bumpkin by saying Meadows Park, okay, Meadow Park, 10 o'clock, bring coffee, sunscreen, shade, all that. It's going to be awesome. Can't wait to see you. God bless you.